You know what? Sometimes it calls upon us to be, dare I say, a bit sensitive. I know you find that hard to believe coming from your boy, Stephen A. But yes, I do have a sensitive side. You're about to hear it right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Holla at your boy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you as I love to do every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at the very least over the digital airwaves of YouTube. As usual, we're here in my studio. Thanks to our official studio sponsor, FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel, the official studio sponsor of the Stephen A. Smith Show. By the way, before I'd say anything further, let me take a moment to acknowledge my appreciation and love for the love and support that I've been receiving from my followers and from the subscribers. Our numbers have succeeded or exceeded 330,000 subscribers in the first six and a half months. I can't thank y'all enough. From the bottom of my heart, I really, really appreciate it. We keep climbing and climbing and climbing by the thousands every single day. The love and support that you give me, I wouldn't be here, to be honest with you, if you didn't show it, because I've got enough jobs. I don't need to do this. I love doing this because I love talking to y'all freely and uninhibited in a fashion that you can do when you own your own platform. And that is exactly what the case is here with the Stephen A. Smith Show for this podcast, this show. Please like and continue to follow the Stephen A. Smith show right here on YouTube. Just click the bell to get notified for all of our new content. And while you're doing that, please don't forget to pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. By the way, just as an aside, we have no calls over the next few weeks. So next two to three weeks, because I am building a new studio. And since we're transitioning from this studio to the new studio, we took out some of those technological, te te techno technical stuff, rather, that is in terms of live phone calls. But that doesn't mean I can't take your questions via Twitter or beyond. Just go to at Stephen A. Smith on Twitter, on Instagram and beyond. And I'm quite sure I'll be happy to read your questions. Facebook as well, uh, meaning Meta. So and Twitter as an X. So let me not forget that kind of stuff. All right. Just want to let y'all know, you know, <clears throat> over the last 24 hours, um, heat has come in this direction. Not so much because people were anticipating that I was going to go all off on Dak Prescott. He put forth an absolutely horrific performance against the San Francisco 49ers on Sunday night. Let's just get that straight. On Sunday night football in the nationally televised games on NBC television, network television, Dak Prescott threw three interceptions. I predicted he would throw two. He threw three. Okay. And with about 13 minutes left in the fourth quarter, the Dallas Cowboys were down 42 to 10. It was a romp. It was a stomp. It was a beat down. And it was at the hands of Dak Prescott, amongst others. Now, clearly, the Dallas Cowboys defense didn't show up. Uh, the 49ers ran roughshod over them. They punked them. They outphysicaled them. And we've heard rumblings from George Kittle and Micah Parsons snapping back at George Kittle's, talking about, oh, we're going to remember, we're going to remember, we're going to take it personal. Michael Parsons is that dude. I don't underestimate anything that he says or does and what he brings to the table. San Francisco 49ers seemed like they figured him out and stuff like that. We get all of that, too. I understand it. I understand it. But there's a bigger story. Dare I say a more sensitive one. That's developing or has developed with Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott has been so subpar, so uninspiring. So small in big moments. That you actually have people that are vacillating between saying he's done in Dallas to saying, let's have some compassion. Let's have some compassion. I had a friend of mine call me and literally beg me, beg me to be nice. And he ain't even a Dallas Cowboy fan. Seriously. Called me Monday morning, hours before I showed up on my day job, ESPN's first take, which airs every weekday morning from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Eastern Standard Time over the airwaves of ESPN television. Actually called me. And said, Stephen A., please, please, please lay off of Dak Prescott. You know what he brought to my attention? He brought to my attention Dak's battles with anxiety and depression. And thinking about the month that we're living in right now, Mental Health Month, it's what I call it. It's what a lot of people call it. Where we talk about the subject of depression. We talk about anxiety. We've witnessed uh, stories, rather, about people taking their own lives, doing harm to themselves, sometimes fatally, obviously, sometimes not. I felt compelled to adopt that, 
to adopt that position. Now, it's not going to stop me from doing my job. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it ain't a damn mongoose. If you played like garbage, I got to say you played bad. But there's a glee and a joyfulness that I take from the Dallas Cowboys stinking up the joint because I Dallas Cowboy fans get on my last damn nerves. But I say that in all seriousness out of fun. It's oxymoronic to use those two words in the same sentence, but it is applicable. As serious as I am, I'm just having fun. It's sports. You never remember growing up as a kid as a sports fan and you sitting up there and you want to get at your friends who root for certain teams or you want to boo against other teams or you want to, you know, just just berate them and all of this other stuff. It's all in fun. That's what fandom is all about. But it's taken on a life of its own. And I want to be the first one to stand up here and say, I'm sensitive to that when it comes to Dak Prescott, because I looked at his face on that sideline and I have to admit, I really, really didn't think about all the things that he has been through until one of my boys called me a few hours before I went on first take. And then I went back because I obviously DVR the games and I went back and I watched Dak Prescott again. And I looked at this blank look on his face and I looked at teammates that were standing away from him. And I looked at people that were keeping their distance from him. And you saw the level of disgust and annoyance and disappointment. And you wonder, you found yourself wondering how that affected him. And I got to tell y'all something. I'm a diehard sports fan. I'm even more rigid and dogged and committed to my professional responsibilities. But I'm a human being first. I'm a man who fears God first. And believe it or not, even though it doesn't seem that way on television and what have you, I do have compassion all the time. And I think there are times when it's important to showcase that and put that on display because God knows the world that we're living in today it's needed. Dak Prescott in 2020 admitted that through the quarantine, when COVID hit, he was experiencing motions that he never felt before. His quote was anxiety, the main one. And then honestly, a couple of days before my brother passed away, I would stay, I would say I started experiencing depression. Those were Dak Prescott's words. And you know the scary part that really, really hit me? It was when he said it was a couple of days before his brother passed. Ladies and gentlemen, his brother didn't pass away as simple and plain and as awful as that is. His brother committed suicide. And he talked about how when he lost his mom seven years earlier, his brother was having trouble then. If I'm being totally honest, I know the feeling. Anybody who knows me knows that in June, June 1st, 2017 to be exact, Game one of the NBA Finals between the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Anybody who knows me knows what that day is. That was the day I lost the greatest woman I've ever known. I lost the greatest human being I've ever known. And that was Janice Smith, my mother. And when I tell you, when I read Dak Prescott's words when I went back and read what he said and talked about the difficulty his brother had, ladies and gentlemen, I can relate. I never thought about killing myself, but for two years, every single day at some moment in time, I wished I was dead. That is how bad my life was without my mother. And I'll tell you something. And I've said this privately to many, many people. You know, the worst, one of the worst parts about losing my mother, because the reality is, is that she battled cancer for a long time and she was suffering. But one of the things that really, really, really raked my soul 
it wasn't just that she passed away because her passing away, at least she was no longer in pain. At least she wasn't suffering. It was just about the fact that I was going to miss her, but that's the selfish part. The other part of me was happy that it was over for her because she wasn't suffering any longer. But the part about me that I couldn't move beyond for so long where I actually had to go to therapy, because we know how black men can be about therapy, at least at a time in the past, maybe not now, but in the past, men period, but especially black men. Therapy, that's not something we want to hear. We want to sit down before somebody and just let all of our feelings out and let it flow. We didn't want to do that. But when it hit home for me was the fact that I was single. You see, when you get married, supposedly, that baton, that proverbial mantle, you're passing to somebody else. Your mama's passing it to her. And it's your responsibility right now to take care of my baby boy. And when you're married and you've committed your life to somebody else, what you've done is you've embraced that reality. And so as painful and as much as it hurts to lose your mama, you found somebody else that's supposed to be an extension of mama to at least to some degree to facilitate taking care of you in a fashion you're accustomed to, whether it be mentally, emotionally, or beyond. But when you don't have that, when you're single, you're on your own. Because since you never made that commitment, but you knew you had that kind of unconditional love from your mama, the belief that you have in your soul is, I'll never find this. And you know when it hit me? When the casket was lowering into the ground. That is when that is when it was over. And I felt it was over. And I wanted to die because she meant that much to me. And I knew that for the rest of my life, I would never, ever, ever have anyone like that again. So when Dak Prescott said that about his brother, after the loss of his mother, I could relate. But then I extended it to Dak Prescott and I said, damn, how is he feeling? And then all of a sudden you find yourself going on the air and in one hat, I got the cowboy hat on, I got the shades and I'm laughing about the cowboys and then I'm speaking about Dak Prescott, but I catch myself. Because I don't want that brother to ever feel like he's in that kind of abyss. That life is that low. I might mock and make fun and cheer about a Cowboys loss, but that's just me as a fan having fun against Cowboy fans. I wish him no harm. I wish him no ill will. I want him to get paid. I want him to live a fruitful life. And hell, if it meant him being better fully, hell, I might even wish for the Cowboys to win. As much as that would be torture for me having to listen to these damn Cowboy fans. It drive me nuts. But, certain things would be worth it because certain things are just bigger than games and bigger than fun. Even if it's all in good fun, doesn't mean I'm going to root for the Cowboys. Doesn't mean I'm going to root for Dak Prescott to win football games and not mess up or whatever the case may be. I just want him to be all right. And I'm not saying that I saw any indication or, or, or believed there was an indication to wonder about otherwise. I'm just saying, looking at him on that sidelines and looking at how people were keeping their distance from him and imagining how alone he was going to feel. While I was watching the game, I didn't notice it like that. But when my boy called me the next morning and I went back and DVR'd it and I looked at Dak Prescott, I got worried. So I just wanted to make sure I stated that. And I want to dedicate this episode of the Stephen A. Smith show, the tackling some of these issues to make sure that points are clarified for the betterment of everybody. Because that's what we're going to do. I brought up Dak Prescott. I still ain't root for them damn cowboys now because of their fans. 
But I don't want Dak Prescott to be the cause of them going down. I'll call it like I see it. It's big boy, big girl rules. But there's a heightened level of sensitivity that has to come with it, particularly in a month like this where we're discussing mental health more than we ever do. And we're being honest about the feelings and the emotions that come with it. Let me transition in an effort to highlight the better by reminding everybody about what I had to say about Chase Claypool, formerly of the Pittsburgh Steelers, formerly of the Chicago Bears, now a member of the Miami Dolphins, whose career I believe is on the line. I said what I had to say. I meant what I meant. But it was with no vitriolic intent. It was, no, it was with no animus or anything. It's with genuine concern. Because on a day like today when I'm doing this podcast and my mood and my psyche and my mindset is what it is. It's important that we tackle some of these issues so I can give a framework of who I am, where I'm coming from. And when I speak to these issues, I want people to know why. So before I go any further. Once Clay, Chase Claypool got traded from the Chicago Bears to the Miami Dolphins, by the way, he was a healthy scratch with Chicago. So Chicago, who was sticking up the joint, who couldn't buy productive football and save their damn, news, their damn life, who gave Bad News Bears a good name. Those Chicago Bears, this is before they won this past weekend, by the way, beating the Washington Commanders. They moved Chase Claypool out of there. Here's what George Truly, on my day job on first take, had to say about Chase Claypool when I was on the air last Friday, live from Iowa. When I had to speak with superstar Caitlin Clark, I had to interview her for an event at Iowa. When I did the show first take from there that morning and the Chase Claypool issue came up, here's what I had to say. Chase Claypool, please listen to me, brother. Please listen to me. This ain't about football. RC, Bart Scott, Chris Canty, everybody know you can play. We saw your skills in Pittsburgh before you got traded to Chicago. You are developing a very bad reputation. If you are being moved out of Pittsburgh and now they sit up there and you are literally a healthy scratch as RC just articulated, that is not about your game. It is about your character. And you, all you got to do is Google and research history and find out there are plenty of players some more talented than you, some who were Hall of Famers, who no one wanted in their locker room for whatever reason. That is, the, that is the reputation you are developing. And if you don't turn it around, this could very well be your last stop. My brother, whatever it is going on up here, please get it together so you can shine and show the world what you can do as a football player. Because if you keep getting moved, the message is going to be indelibly sent. You're not somebody they want in the locker room. and They're not going to care about how you can play. They're not going to want you around them. I said all of that about Chase Claypool because I want Chase Claypool to remain in the National Football League. You see, <clears throat> there's a few people that have been out of the NFL for reasons other than their game. Chase Claypool can ball. He can play. He's not a scrub. But he was a hazard in the locker room in the eyes of the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was a hazard in the locker room in the eyes of the Chicago Bears. Maybe it's because he wasn't getting the ball enough. Maybe because the offense wasn't evolving around him long enough or enough. Maybe because he just had a petulant attitude. I don't know. I've only met him once, only talked to him once, which was at the Super Bowl in Arizona. I wish him nothing but the best. But something happened and somebody needed to tell him. So I told him they're about to get you up out of here, bro. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't tell people stuff like that with glee in my heart. I don't do that. I want you to get paid and I'm not apologizing for this, especially if you're a brother. And that doesn't mean white, Latino, anybody else. I don't want you to get paid. But damn it, I'm a black man. And times get tough. And you know what my favorite saying is, when white folks catch a cold, black folks catch pneumonia. It's always worse for us. It's always worse for us. 
And so you got to dot I's and cross T's and recognize the potholes, the pitfalls, and everything else in between that can stymie or impede or downright stop your progress. Chase Claypool is at that point. Why did I bring that up? Because he ain't the only one. I ain't bringing up Terrell Owens to knock him. I'm done with all of that. I've said what I had to say. He said what he had to say. We'll probably never speak to each other again in life, and that's fine with me. But I don't wish the brother no harm. I don't want him to fail in life. He's one of the greatest receivers the NFL has ever seen. He should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer, not a third ballot. You can't find four receivers in the history of the National Football League better than Terrell Owens. I don't give a damn what anybody says. So why was he going so early? Even at the age of 48 or 49, a year or two ago, he looked like he could play better than most of the players. He was going because they didn't want him in their locker room. I don't know why. I know what they say, but that's not important right now. I'm only making the point to point out it ain't your abilities all the time. Chad Ochocinco, I know that things didn't end well for him in New England, but that brother for eight years or so in Cincinnati was the truth. He could have played longer. But in some people's eyes, that Ocho Cinco stuff out, wore out its welcome. Love seeing him on club, you know, on, on, on the podcast with Shannon Sharp, my partner in crime now on first take on every Monday and Tuesday. Chad Ocho, I love Chad. I got no shade to throw on him, just like I ain't throwing no shade on T.O. I did weeks ago, and that's between me and T.O., and that's over and done with, because I explained that already. But I'm not throwing shade on him here. I'm simply saying right, wrong, fair or unfair. His ability is not why he wasn't on an NFL squad for years. T.O. could have went an additional four or five years playing football for somebody. But they didn't want him in the locker room. They didn't want Chad Ochocinco in the locker room. I don't know why. I'm not speculating. Actually, I do know a lot why because I cover sports. But that's neither here nor there. The point is. They didn't want him there. And there's a plethora of other players throughout NFL history, throughout basketball history, Major League Baseball history and beyond. There's always dudes that end up having their careers cut short for things that have absolutely nothing to do with their ability to still play. That is the path Chase Claypool is on. Now, why would Stephen A. point that out? Because I care. You think I don't know what it's like to be in these streets, to lift yourself up and to elevate yourself to a point where you can make the kind of living that most people can't make in a lifetime? You think I don't know? You think I don't care? Of course. If you got a microphone, you got a camera in front of you, it's your responsibility to speak up on this stuff. And it ain't your responsibility to hug and sing kumbaya to one another and just tell people what the hell they want to hear. You got to tell them what they need to hear. You don't sit there and pacify children, do you? And just let them do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. Knowing they're young, wet behind the ears, breath smelling like Similac. You don't just let them do that. You check them. And you check them for the sole express purpose of helping them prevent minefields that lie in wait to derail their progress. When you care, that is what you do. That's why I brought up this subject. It's why I'm sticking with it. When I get into even more stuff and more names, whether it's Rich Paul, whether it's Marcellus Wiley and more. Yeah, I'm just getting started. I'm in that kind of mood. You're listening live to Stephen A. On the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more in a minute.
Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use, by the way. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, over and unders, and, oh, this is a fun one. Player props. That's how granular you can get with FanDuel. You think one wide receiver is going to score a touchdown and everyone's overlooking him? That's where you can make a splash. And that's what makes the game all the more exciting to watch. This is why I love FanDuel. So visit FanDuel.com slash SAS and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the National Football League. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.com. Org slash chat in Connecticut, 1 800 9 with it in Indiana, 1 800 522 4700, or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1 877 770 STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland, visit 1 800 gambler.net in West Virginia, or call 1 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800 327 5050 for 24 7 support in Massachusetts, or call 1 877 8 Hope NY or text Hope NY in New York. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith show right here over the digital airways of YouTube coming at you at the very least every Monday, Wednesday and Fridays, most times more on occasion, less depending on my traveling schedule. Um, thank you for tuning in as always. And thanks again to all the subscribers out there. We've exceeded over 330,000 in the first six and a half months since this show has been on YouTube as the Stephen A. Smith show. So thank you for your support and love and please keep it coming. I started off talking about Dak Prescott. I angled my way into the subject about uh, mental illness, mental depression, et cetera, et cetera. Talked about Chase Claypool. Um, not that that had anything to do with it, but just having compassion to point out when somebody is doing things or allegedly doing things that will derail their careers. Because I want to point out how Chase Claypool is on the clock. If it don't work out in Miami, since Pittsburgh and Chicago has already given up, uh, given up on him in the National Football League, the word is out. And if he doesn't make sure it works in Miami, it could be over for his career. And I think the brother is too talented to go out like that. But we've seen others before that have gone out prematurely because of how they were labeled. And I think it's important to recognize the fact that that's something that we need to guard against. But that's not the world of sports as an athletes. Professional athletics is not the only category where Cynicism, friction, tension exist. It can also be in this industry. It can also be in the industry of sports agency. Um, this morning, talking to Rich Paul, founder, CEO, of Clutch Sports, um, represents LeBron James, Draymond Green, uh, Ben Simmons. Anthony Davis and various others. Rich Paul has made a name for himself, negotiating in excess of $4 billion in contracts. Um, he's been highly successful. Um, some people get at him and say it's only because he knew LeBron James. I'm not going for that. Rich Paul is highly intelligent, very accomplished, worked his tail off, deserves everything he has achieved. Props to him. I'll give LeBron James props for giving him an opportunity because as LeBron James stated, he doesn't give many people chances, but he gave it to this kid. Okay. Uh, who was hustling in the streets, rolling dice, um, selling drugs, list goes on and on and look at him now. LeBron James is, is one of his best friends. He's LeBron James agent. And he's the, he's Adele's boyfriend, brother doing his thing. Major, major, major props to him. So I want to give him props for that. But he touched on something on first take this morning when speaking about contemporaries in his profession that threw me for a loop. I didn't have enough time to get into it, so I didn't address it. 
but I wanted to reiterate what he pointed out just to address it now. Listen to what Rich Paul, super agent, had to say on first take this morning. It's just a different time now. And the unfortunate thing is, I used to have a profound respect for those in my field. I've lost that respect for a lot of them. Very few that I have that respect for. Because? Just because of the lack of integrity, um, the lack of professionalism, and the, the way they do things. Um, it's just something that when you read that book, you'll understand why I am the way I am. And it goes back to the situation that we had on, on Gil's thing. It wasn't me trying to be a certain way towards Stephen A. You know, I would never do that. Right. What it was about was I was raised in a community to where that energy we had to navigate through every day. It ain't about me being tough because I'm, I'm for peace, right? Same here. But exactly, from right. Queens. And so I never exude, I never bring that to anybody. And so when I look at today's landscape, I just don't see the the polishing that I got in my community by anywhere, wherever I went, in your somebody industry. was sharpening my knife. You yeah. don't see that in your industry? No, no, because nobody did it to me. Not, no black agents came to me and said, Rich, let me help you, let me show you, let me help you understand. What they did was they went into families and talked bad about me. Oh, he's just a kid, he's just LeBron's friend, et cetera, et cetera. When LeBron's done, he's going to be done, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I'm and shocked so to hear you did, say that because I didn't never expect heard that. that. I got you. Well, that's the fact. I got you. Okay. Gonna, there's right. no gray with me. There's right. black and white. All right. And so I definitely wasn't going to get it from the, the, the establishment. So, I, but I also grew up in a time where I didn't expect you to do nothing for me either. I, I didn't. I didn't have that expectation. So, it didn't hurt me at all. I was mm -hmm. going to go no matter what because that's how I was raised. But, yeah. But for me, I'm not going to do unto others what was done to me, right. I pay it forward. So I'm giving the game away. In that book, I'm giving the game away to right. anybody that's aspiring to be whatever they want to be. Now, there you have it. Rich Paul is talking about how agents, um, particularly black agents, didn't help him. Um, not to direct this comment towards him because I know he's a big boy. He can handle his business and he has, I might add, but I had to, if I had more time, I would have come to the defense of those agents. When I think about black agents, I think about Aaron and Eric Goodwin, twin brothers who've done a phenomenal job being agents over the years. They used to represent LeBron James, by the way. And I'm quite sure Rich Paul learned a thing or two from watching them do their work with LeBron initially uh, before um, CAA uh, got a hold of LeBron for a short while. Leon Rose, Worldwide, William Wesley, those guys at the time anyway. But Rich Paul learned the tricks of the trade, sat, watched, listened, learned, mastered. And now he's one of the best in the business. Um and most of the players that I encounter, if not all of them, speak very, very highly of his stewardship over their careers as, as, as their representatives. But they also speak that way about Bill Duffy. They also speak that way about the Goodwin brothers. Okay, I remember Henry Thomas, God rest his wonderful son, Hank Thomas. He used to represent D. Wade and Chris Bosh and those guys. They loved the ground he walked on. He was class personified. I remember the days of Bill Strickland who used to represent Rashid Wallace and others. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for cats like that showing me the way. And so there's a tremendous level of appreciation that I have for all of these ages. And I, it was unfortunate for me to hear Rich Paul talk about contemporaries like that. I'm in no position to say whether he's right or wrong because I don't know the intricacies of their business meaning you, you hear a lot of stories, but do I know definitively what they did or didn't do with him, to him, for him, or whatever the case may be? No, I don't. Nor do I know what he did with, to, or for them. But I do know this. For years, there was a paucity of African-Americans as agents. When we heard about super agents before, we heard about Swartz and we heard about David Falk and guys like that, you know, 
Jeff Wexler, and who's a great agent, by the way, and along with various others. We've heard those names. We didn't hear about too many brothers representing African-American athletes. And so when stuff like that is said, um, there's but so many, even though he mentioned no names, Rich Paul mentioned no names. It ain't too hard to look at the selection of individuals he was talking about because how many agents who happen to be black are representing professional athletes. And I just wanted to say that it's a dog eat dog world. And one of the things that I have this cardinal rule of mine, I've always been this way where <clears throat> if you are in a game, then the rules of those game of those games are nothing to bitch about. I remember when people used to sit up there and say, well, this program is paying this athlete this and this program is playing that athlete that. Well, damn it, ain't y'all all paying? And if you're all paying, what you bitching for? Somebody went offered more money than the other. What you trying to get me involved in it for? That's the game y'all chose. And I just wanted to say that because, you know, when you're representing agents, everybody's competing for those star athletes. Everybody knows who the money makers are. When you go into their living room in front of themselves, their family members, their hanger ons, et cetera, et cetera, you got to make your pitch. Now, I wouldn't encourage anybody to be unethical in doing so. But what I'm saying is our definition of ethics may not be their definition of, a definition of ethics in their chosen profession. Because what comes with the game comes with the game. And that's the way it goes. So I just wanted to say that because I wanted to absolve all agents, white and black, rich, Paul and beyond. The game that they play is their game. Whatever their rules are, whatever they do to one another, don't tell me nobody does. Somebody or, or, or everybody does what one particular person never does. I'm sorry. Everybody's stained. Everybody's hands is dirty in some capacity. It's the way it goes. And let's be big boys about it. I want to transition because I was on a breakfast club last week and I made some noise about Marcellus Wiley. I only brought it, I only addressed it because it was asked to me by Charlemagne the God. DJ Envy and Charlemagne the God were interviewing me and they saw some stuff about Marcellus Wiley coming at me and he said something um, along those lines about <laughs> me being scared of the intelligence. I won't even say the man's name anymore, my former colleague, because every time I mention his name, folks lie. They create headlines, they change shit, and they make stuff up. And I'm tired of going through all of that. I've stated my position. I'm not a liar. Look at my book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. It's all in there. It's all there. Just go look. But I wanted to reiterate what I said about Marcellus Wiley. Because ain't nobody scared. I say what I want to say. What I do want to say is this, a couple of things. The individual who he felt the need to come to the protection of, that's his best friend. So guess what, Marcellus Wiley? I wish I had a friend like you. Actually, I'm lying because I already have friends like you. I've got a bunch of friends that will come to my aid just like you came to the aid of our former colleague. Who, by the way, is a former. He'll always be a colleague because he'll be back in the business doing his thing. But that's neither be here nor there. My only disappointment in Marcellus Wiley was what he said. To be in the year 2023, and to accuse a black man of being scared of the intelligence of another black man is just one of the saddest things you could possibly do. I'm not mad. I'm not hurt. It was disappointing to hear. 
But for all of y'all looking for some kind of shade or whatever, we ain't going to be a hypocrite. I've always had love for Marcellus Wiley. There was never, ever, ever a single day when that brother was not kind to me, that he was not respectful to me, that he was not decent to me. And just because I disagree with what he said doesn't mean that I'm going to clap back at him and offend him. I got mad love for all of my colleagues. Marcellus Wiley was one of those people. I'm sorry he's gone from ESPN. I'm sorry he's gone from FS1. I hope whatever it is that he's doing, and I'm assuming it's something more than just this podcast because the brother's bright as hell. I wish him nothing but the best. If I saw him, the only thing that I would say to him is, bro, really? That's what we doing now? A black man is scared of the intelligence of a black, of a white dude? Really? In the year 2023, we going to say something like that? Because I can assure you, I ain't scared of nobody. Not when it comes to intellect. You know why I'm not scared? Because either I'm just as smart, if not smarter, or I learn from their intelligence and it makes me more intelligent. So I'm always winning. I'm always winning. Now, there's a lot of people out there that want me to address other names. There's one particular person who will remain nameless. And I will not deny it. I think he's a fat, no good bastard who I despise to the core. But it doesn't mean that I wish him harm. It just means I know what he is. That is not Marcellus Wiley I'm talking about. It ain't hard to figure out who the hell I'm talking about. But even then, I wish him no harm. Even though he has made a career out of maligning and ridiculing and trying to wish others the worst. I'm where I'm at. That particular individual is where he's at. And I'll leave it at that. And no, I'm not talking about Marcellus Wally again. No, I'm not talking about my former colleague on first take. No, I'm not talking about them. They ain't fat bastards. Who's, who's, who, who are seeds of the devil. Wishing nothing but black folks home. But I'll leave that for another day for when the time is right. In the end, we all have to be strong. We all have to be mindful of the fact that challenges come our way. Adversity is inevitable. Roadblocks are as well. It ain't about getting knocked down. It's are you going to get the hell back up? We want to see it from our athletes. We want to see it from all of us. That's what it's all about. And that's what I'm here to help provide on the Stephen A. Smith show to the best of my ability. I might not be qualified to do that in a lot of people's eyes. To others, I might be. All I hope is to help where I can. Sometimes it's going to be being as real and as authentic as I possibly feel I need to be. Other times, it's touching on subjects with a heightened level of sensitivity like I choose to do today. Sometimes that approach is more necessary than others. I hope you can appreciate that. I know I have in the past. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with your messages to respond to in a minute to close out the show. Don't touch that dial. I'm still coming. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. And just for clarification purposes, I was not talking about Dan Levitar. First of all, he's my buddy. I want to go to the messages. Some people have tweeted me and they want to ask some questions. So who am I to disappoint? Let's get right to these questions and get on out of here. Let's go to at Miss Patricia Scott, too. She writes, Stephen A., what's your plans for your upcoming birthday? That's what she said. 
what are my plans for my upcoming birthday? That's what she said. Um, I haven't decided yet. Um, I still don't celebrate my birthday much. Um, my brother died in 1992, uh, the week of my birthday. And I have never, ever celebrated it since because I think about him a lot, but especially during that time. Brings back a lot of memories. I'm not nearly as bad as I was when I first lost him. Um, but it's still hard. So sometimes I'm around and, you know, you hang out and you enjoy yourself with family, friends and loved ones and you enjoy yourself. But I like it to just come and go, you know, sneak up on me. Um, but my daughters, you know, they're my everything. So, you know, I, I'm, I always bring in my birthday with them and they always start my day off right smiling. It's just that I always let them go and do their thing. And then that leaves me alone. And when that leaves me alone, I kind of think a lot. And then I'm just waiting for the day to end. I'm not a person that wants people around me on my birthday. I never have been that way. Um, because they're reminding you it's your birthday. And that's the last thing I want to be reminded of. I actually don't mind getting older. It doesn't bother me at all. I wouldn't want to be young in this day and age to say my damn life world is too jacked up. But I would tell you that, hey, it is what it is. Um, but I'm a lot better now. Thank you for asking. I'll do something. I ain't going to be miserable. I promise you that. Anyway, next up at Union Addressed. Stephen A., do you have any plans to grow your media enterprise? Something like what we're seeing from your peers, such as Colin Cowherd. Yes, I most certainly do eventually. But here's the thing. I'm not interested in just sports. Sports will always be a part of me. I'm just not interested in being limited to just that. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Next up, Jamara Hudson at Jamara23732. Stephen A., can we put some respect on the Detroit Lions team and how they are the top in the, Nash in the NFC North? Well, first of all, you have respect. I picked them to win the division coming into the season. Secondly, Dan Campbell has done a tremendous job. Thirdly, Jared Goff is a top three quarterback in the conference and one of the top quarterbacks in the National Football League. And fourth, you win the division by default. Are the Green Bay Packers? I have no love for love as of yet. Jordan Love is, is struggling. Played against the Oakland Raiders or the Las Vegas Raiders, rather, on Monday Night Football. And what did he do? Do a couple of picks. Three picks, to be exact. Um, he's been a shell of himself since starting out the first two games with six touchdowns and zero interceptions. He's been the complete opposite now. Um, the Chicago Bears, they just won a game. God bless them. They resembled an NFL team. People trying to talk about Stephen A, the worst take ever. They were straight garbage before they won the game. Actually, they should be thanking me because they looked like trash before I went off on them and how awful they, were been, they had been. And then they finally showed how to resemble an NFL team because I thought they were going to get blown out. And then, of course, there's the Minnesota Vikings. It's bad enough you lost Dalvin Cook. It's bad enough you wasn't making no damn noise to begin with. But then you go out and lose Justin Jefferson with this hamstring injury out for several weeks. Oh, they done. They done. Done. So Detroit got the division by default. Want a cookie? Take it. Let's go to the next one. Elite. Elite Plessy. E-L-L-I-T-T. P-L-E-S-S-I-E. -S -S -E. Stephen A., your routine, how you grind, stay up, watch the games, wake up early, first take, and then your show. Yes, there's no question mark there. You didn't ask a question, so I could get away with not answering it. But you're right. It is about the grind. It is about standing tall and letting the world know that you're going after it and you want it bad and you aim to get what, you, what you're striving for. It is. And it takes hard work. All that glitters ain't go. You got to go for it. To the victor goes the spoils. And oh, by the way, if you lazy as hell, don't expect to accomplish anything. And even if you're lucky enough to accomplish something, don't expect to sustain it. Because people who ain't willing to work hard don't deserve anything. That's just the truth. We're living in a world where too many people are looking for freebies. Damn it, nothing's free. Everything has a price. Everything has a price. I ain't gonna lie to you. I think about that the way my dad used to talk to me about women. Oh, you gonna pay. Directly or indirectly, it's going to cost you. In other words, whether it's dinner, it's a movie, it's a apartment, it's a house, it's a car, it's a vacation, or whatever the case may be. If you're a man, 
You don't get away with being with a woman and providing absolutely nothing. You're going to pay something. There's going to be a price. Accept that and embrace it with joy and glee. Because it's never going away. It's just the truth. Just saying. Next up, Aaron Helms. A-D-H-O-62901. Stephen A., if you could choose five restaurants to eat from for the rest of your life, but you can't eat anywhere else, which five are you choosing? Ooh, okay, okay, okay. I like that. I like that. All right. Believe it or not, first of all, I love catch in L.A. I love catch. They treat me like a king. I love those foods. It's owned by Tillman Fertitta, the owner for the Rockets, Houston Rockets at NBA. Um, but my boy Tim Pratt and a bunch of others, I mean, they treat me like gold. I love them. Catch would be number one on my list. Um, Maestro's in Beverly Hills is pretty nice. Um, Mercer's Kitchen in New York, very, very, very nice. Um, Asiata in, um, I think that's the correct pronunciation for it, Mandarin Oriental, New York City. That's another nice one. And um, are y'all ready for this? It's like a hole in the wall, whatever. Spoon breads in Harlem. The chicken wings, the macaroni and cheese, the string beans, the sweet potatoes, uh, the cornbread. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm just breaking this stuff up because I changed my diet. You know, so I'm trying to stay away from this stuff. But damn, I love it. So I would say those things. Yes, those things. That would definitely hit me. OK, but those would be the five. Got to bring a hole in the wall because you got to go back to the hood. You can't go home. It don't matter where else you go. Got to always go home. And Harlem is one of my spots. OK, so I do like that. Let's go to the next one. At rapper underscore RK2. Why is Wilt Chamberlain left out of so many GOAT conversations? Very, very simple. Regardless of his dominance, at the end of the day, his number one nemesis was Bill Russell. The great Bill Russell. 11 championships to Wilt's two. End of discussion. You can't have a nemesis and they out championship you by 11 to two. That is why Wilt is left off. Sitting out of game seven. Not necessarily being as hurt as he was claiming to be, but not playing. Yeah, that has something to do with it, too. That has something to do with it, too. Got to get on out of here. I appreciate the time, the love, and the dedication. Thank y'all for tuning in, supporting the show. And remember to tune in at the very least every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airwaves of YouTube. I'll be back at y'all in a couple of days. But until then, same bad time, same bad channel. I got to holler, all right? Peace and love, everybody. Take care.